Hi, I'm Alex Ferrari. And I'm Sebastian Tordaz, and thanks for watching our show. We are here with Sydney Freeland, who's a filmmaker with your second film at Sundance. Congratulations. Thank you. Very, very cool. I saw the trailer. It looks hilarious. Can you tell us a little about the, the movie? Uh, yeah, so DJ and Laney, Robert Train, is, it's a dark comedy uh, about a single mom has an apparent mo- emotional breakdown outside of an electronics store and uh, gets thrown in jail. And so her two teenage daughters decide to take up train robbing to bail, to get money to, to, to bail her out. I love it. Yeah. I do. I love it's a great, it's a great, great Yeah, te- teenage, teenage train robbers. Yes, in today's world. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and Netflix picked it up. Correct, yeah. Uh, no, uh, Netflix financed the film uh, up front. Oh, okay. So it's a Netflix all the way. So. Yeah, it's a Netflix original. Oh, nice. So how... So in, what, how did it feel like when you got the first phone call for your first movie to be in Sundance? And, and what was your first movie then? Yeah. What was it like? Oh, man. That first call. Uh, so my first film was played in 2014. It was called Drunk Town's Finest. Uh-huh. Um, you know, much different, much different scenario than this, this mm-hmm. film. And what was it like getting the call? Because um, it's a dream. It's like you won, you won the lottery. It's like the filmmaking lottery is basically getting yeah, the Sundance call. Yeah. Did you, have, did you do the labs or anything like that? Or did you just submit it and... And yeah, so I just did, hope for the best. I did. Uh, I participated in the Native Lab, which is for Native American. So you did in, do the Native Lab, first. Indigenous filmmakers, yeah. Okay. And then um, 2009, 2010, I did the Screenwriters Lab and the Directors Lab. Oh, so you Sundance. did all the labs. Can you tell us about the labs? Because yeah. a lot of people actually don't know that Sundance does all these labs. What are they? What was that experience like? And then, and then we'll, we'll talk right about into, both both yeah. films again, actually, yeah. because I we want to dig down a little more on them. Yeah. So the labs are run by the institute, and they are. The two separate labs. The Screenwriters Lab is this five-day intensive where um, the, the Institute will select 12 films, um, or 12 screenplays, 12 feature screenplays from approximately 1,200 submissions. And um, those 12 screenwriters are invited to the resort, and you spend five days meeting with professional screenwriters, and they essentially tear your film apart, you know? But it's all... it's <laughs> It's all... Yeah, it's yeah. it's constructive and it's designed to like really sort of break this thing down with the idea that you'll come out and make it better. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's but it is an intensive, you know. And it's funny because they they tell you um, when you get there, it's like find a place for your cry. And I was like, I remember going the first time. I was like, I'm not gonna cry. This is a screenplay. And then I cried twice. Did, you, so. did other people cry? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? So like, it's like it's like um, what's when when you go scared straight. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it's like yeah, scared for, straight for, for, for development. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for development. Actually, like scared straight. Say, it's actually not that bad. <laughs> Are they like yelling at you? Oh, God, it's a structure. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say yeah. That would be an awesome movie, by the way. Yeah, if we yeah. actually made that. The Sundance Labs by uh, MSNBC. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dateline. Yeah. <It's> Sundance <laughs> locked up. Locked, locked up at Sundance. Exactly. So, um, they, but they really go like they, I'm assuming they just completely tear it apart, break it down to its core, and then they build you. It's like a military exercise. They break you down, and then they build you back up. In a uh, sense, yeah, yeah, in, the story. In, a, in an artistic sense. Yes, uh, yes. Actually, I think that's a great way to put it. It's like artistic boot camp. Okay, you know, yeah, great. Um, but but the idea, uh, but the, I think the core idea behind it is that they they break you down, but then it's and they try to provide you with the tools so that you can tell your own story. You know, it's not telling you how to. They don't try to tell you how to tell your story. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like trying to help you find your own. And you story. did more than one lab. How many labs did you do over I, uh, several years? Yeah, Native Lab, right? Screeners Lab, Directors Lab, and um, and then I also did uh, the Women's Fellowship in 2015. So you basically grew up at Sundance. Uh, yeah, I, I I consider Sundance to be my film school. Yeah, that's not a bad or, film school to be. Or I would I would the way I sort of put it is like uh, my film school taught me the alphabet. Sundance teaches you how to form a sentence. That's a great. Love it. That's awesome. That's really really. So, good. but your first film was a document. So, w- your first one was a documentary. I, I kind of want to get the timeline on sure. this. Like when 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 you first got here, and then when you when the documentary came about, and then when you got to Deidre. Oh, for the first feature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, that was it. Was a narrative. Well, the first one was. A, oh, why didn't yeah. I think it was a. Oh my, uh, it, drunk. It was a late. It was a late night. It yeah. was as well. <laughs> we, we've had some of those already. We've had a, it was okay. a late night. Oh, okay. So wait, so what was it about? Because I did not see it, so obviously. So the first feature was uh, Drunk Town's Finest, yeah. uh, a contemporary ensemble uh, piece about Native Americans. Okay. Um, or uh, I, the short pitch is uh, it's Crash with Indians. <laughs> so a, a big budget, okay. very mass appeal movie. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was a four-quadrant uh, film. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 
Uh, and how did that do? Uh, how, like, what was the life cycle of that film? Yeah, so it actually um, so it premiered here. Uh, so I had a had a good festival run. It played in about seventy five festivals. Wow. Jeez, um, wow. And, uh, you know, we sold international, we have domestic distribution, um, it's currently on iTunes, Amazon, you know, all those portals. And, um, but I think most importantly for this film is that I came out of the festival and was able to sign with a management company and get a manager. Mm-hmm. And my manager is the person who got me this current script, Deidre and Laney. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And then that, and that, and you, and that was a Netflix original, so it went right to yeah. Netflix right after that. Yeah. How is it working with Netflix? Uh, Netflix has been great. They, really? Yeah, I think people say, like, they were like, oh, they're very hands-off, and I didn't really know what that meant. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it literally means hands-off. And, and they just get, here's a check, and we need a movie in so many of them. Yeah, so, so we, we went in, we pitched the film, you know, right. we pitched the film and, um, you know, <clears throat> did a couple of revisions to the script, and they, uh, you know, essentially financed the film up front, mm-hmm. said, here's the funding, uh, please deliver us a film, and gave us a, a lot of creative freedom. You know, and they did give notes. They did give they did give feedback, and but the notes and feedback were were extremely constructive and helpful. Really cool. Yeah, it was it was it was a really great experience. No, I wanted to go back to that one question I asked you. What was it like getting that first phone call? Oh right. I don't know that she had that first phone call because you. I mean, you, you, you grew through up, that process. I did. Yeah. You go, well, you, what was oh, and then what was the like getting the first phone call that you got into the first lab? Because that's still kind that's of like, that's kind of like a lottery ticket. So door, right? yeah. So the native lab was. Um, so the Native Lab, it's more of a feeder program. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, they're, they're kind of like feeder programs into the larger labs. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I remember getting the call for the Screenwriters Lab. And I was, um, I was in my, my home, or I was in my dad's home in New Mexico, and I got the call. And then I went out to the living room, and I, I just, I literally broke down crying and fell on the floor. You know? Because wow. it was like, you know, because you sort of like, as a filmmaker, you try, it's very hard. You know, and you, you have, you know, it's very hard to get a film made. <laughs> and it's, yes. it's even harder to get support for, like, even, like, a screenplay, mm-hmm. you know. And so for myself, um, you know, I'm coming, I'm coming from a background where I grew up on a, I grew up on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. Uh, film, the film industry is, is leaves Minim- a lot. Minimal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah minimal is, 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 a, is a very optimistic term. Um, non-existent, right. you know, the film industry in in back home is non-existent. Like all this is, you know, doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, the concept, I, I remember for me grasping the concept of like filmmaking was this like radical thing for me. Like wait, people can make movies. And then beyond that, it was like, wait, people get paid to work on movies. I know. I, I had the same feeling like what? Like, yeah. People like what? Yeah. And so that, that was a completely foreign concept to me. And well, but, what I find fascinating too is um, there's a lot of people listening and watching who are in the same position you are, like in a filmmaking vacuum. Yeah. Basically, that there's no support, there's no infrastructure. For, and like, if you're in LA, obviously, it's super easy to become a filmmaker. And not to be a successful filmmaker, but to learn and to, and to work and stuff like that. Yeah. All the tools are there. But it's so much more impressive, I think, coming from your background. To be like, you've got to do everything yourself. You have to go out and search that information. You got to rally people to be like, do you want to be in a movie? What's what do you mean? What like that's so much more difficult. Can you tell us a little bit about like how did you get your first like short done? I'm trying to even think what my first short was. Um, it, it was a while ago, but I I think basically what my sort of my sort of timeline was. I went to film school. I graduated uh, the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. Oh, that's a good that's a good school. So. Yeah, and, and it, you know. Well, well, I, well, I actually want to go back a little further. Because yeah. you grew up in the Navajo Reservation. When did you know you wanted to make movies? How did you get out? I mean, how did, how did that happen? I mean, it is a different world. Sure, sure. So growing up, you know, like, uh, I was, there's, there's a huge, there's a lot of arts in, in, yes. on the in reservation. Sa- but Santa it's, Fe, it's more kind of like, yeah, it's more sort of like, I say like traditional mediums, you know, painting, <laughs> weaving, pottery, uh, silversmithing, uh, things like that. Sure. So that's what I was that's what I was exposed to growing up. And so I went to um, undergraduate school to study painting and drawing because that's what I thought I wanted to do. Where did you go? Uh, Arizona State. Okay. Uh, go, go Devils. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, He's from Arizona. He's from, uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Austin. Austin, Austin uh, our camera guy. Is wild from Arizona. Cat. Shooting, yes. <laughs> um, and 
uh, so, in, you know, while I was in school, I was exposed to, you know, a number of things, computer art, computer animation, photography, uh, creative writing. You know, mm-hmm. even creative writing was like this, like, new thing. It was like, wait, like, you can just write, write? and tell a story? And, you and know? someone might paint? Well, <laughs> no, no, not even paint, but, like, you can write for fun, you know? Right. And, um, and so, and then my final semester, I took this class. It was called, like, it was something generic. It was, like, movies or video or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, it was basically Cinema 101, and we made these little short films in there. And I, you know, not to sound cliche, but it was sort of like, oh, this is what I want to do, mm-hmm. you know. And um, what I liked about it is that, like, all those things I just mentioned, it combined into one, you know. And it was, but it was still telling a story. And uh, so from there, I applied to film school. Again, knew nothing about film school. And so how I got to the to the Academy of Art was I did a Google search for graduate film programs, mm-hmm. and I got an alphabetical list. And the first hit was Academy of Art, <laughs> AAU. And so it was in San Francisco. And it was like, to have that. Yeah. And it was like, I That's love San Francisco. That's how Netflix or some of the things work, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love San Francisco. Yeah. I'll go there. And that's how I got to film school. That's awesome. That's very, very Okay, cool. but there's, there's more. Were you a Fulbright scholar? Uh, yeah, that was uh, 2004. I mean, this is, this is, you've uh, got some amazing you're things. Fa- you're fairly impressive, I have to say. <laughs> was there computer animation somewhere in here? Yeah, that, so that was... I mean, why do you miss all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, keep so, going. so technically the, um, yeah, I, my, my BFA degree is technically in computer animation. Okay, although cool. I realized very quickly that was not, I don't, I don't have the, um, um, uh, you have to be extremely patient to be an animator. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's a very. I I love the result, but I think the process is very intensive. Yeah. Um, and um. Uh, yeah, and, and so that's that. That's why. Okay, happened. that's that part. Yeah. And where did Fulbright come in? Oh. That's pretty impressive too. This Fulbright was for a. Uh, I'm gonna try. I'm probably. I might butcher this, but it's for a field study of indigenous peoples of the Ecuadorian Andes and Amazon. Wow. Wow. Uh, long, uh, short way of saying, you know, spending uh, uh, 10 weeks in uh, Ecuador. That, I think, you know, that's, by the way, where I got the documentary thing in my head. Because oh, okay. I read about yeah, the full yeah, I was like, oh, I, th- I thought that was the way in yeah, at some point. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so you sound very lazy, and you don't seem like you like to work a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting, it's a really interesting journey. Uh, and then, and then you, you did do shorts, but one of the yeah. standout ones was Hoverboard. Yeah, Hoverboard. So what is it? So, okay, so that's, so that... I think this is a, I think this is a perfect example for like people who are maybe like trying to get into the industry. So, 2007, I graduated from film school, moved to Los Angeles, mm-hmm. um, and um, <laughs> should I tell should I tell the story? My first story. Right. Let's hear it. Please. Okay. So this is how I got my first job <laughs> in Los Angeles, right? Yes. Um, I finished film school. I go back to the reservation. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a I did a summer program in Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm-hmm. and I met a person there who's like working with a producer. He says, hey, I live in Los Angeles. Um, uh, if you have a resume, we may have something that we're working on later on. I can pass it along if you want, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, whatever. I gave him my resume, didn't think twice about it. Fast forward a couple of weeks, um, I'm now back home on the reservation mm-hmm. um, trying to think like, what do I do now? Uh, I just, I'm student, I, <laughs> I've got a mountain of uh, student loans I need to repay. Yes. Um, and uh, I remember I was in the parking lot of a Walmart and so it was a Friday. Um, so it's Friday evening in the parking lot of a Walmart in Gallup, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, like, what the hell am I going to do? And I get a phone call um, from, like, you know, this 310 area code. I don't know 310 area code, you know. <laughs> it's, it's L.A. It's L.A., yeah. It's L- and it's so LA. It's, it's this person on the phone is like, hey, Sydney, I'm a producer. Um, I have your resume. Um, uh, can you come in? Can you come in for an interview Sunday at midnight? And what day was it? You? It's Friday. Yeah. So he says, can you come in Sunday at midnight? At midnight? At a Starbucks in Westwood. What? And I was sitting in the parking lot. That's very L.A., though. That is kind of L.A. And, and I, so, I wouldn't do that. And I was yeah. standing. I know, but still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was standing in the parking lot, and I was thinking, and this, you know, the prison didn't know I was in New Mexico. So sure, I, was, sure. I was standing in the parking lot, and I was like, <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> And, and then you robbed the train. That's the right answer, by the yeah. way. Then you robbed the train, <laughs> hopped yeah. on it. <laughs> yes. No, so then I, I threw all my shit in my car. I drove to L.A., never been there before. Pulled in about 10 p.m. on a Sunday night. <laughs> to the Starbucks. Yeah, and this is, you know, I had the map quest thing because I didn't have GPS at the time. Sure, sure. Um, the map quest printout on the paper. Oh, yeah. Showed yeah. up at a 
showed up at Starbucks at Westwood at midnight, and there's this, you know, old ex hippie guy in the back room or in the back, you know, waved me over. I came over, we talked for five minutes, and he said, "Huh, you seem okay. Uh, show up at this address tomorrow, eight a.m." And um, and it was wow. it was for a um, it was the first episode of a twenty six um, episode run of an Asian cooking show, and I was a PA on that. Really? And so yeah, so that sort of got that got me my first job, and um, and then so and then. From there, um, I primarily worked in camera and editing departments, would mm-hmm. go back and forth. And then, um, so that's sort of what my production background is. And then, um, you know, sort of going back and forth, uh, some, you know, second AC, a little bit of first, uh, media manager, DIT, assistant uh, editor, um, some post-production supervising, and sort of swinging back and forth between those two departments. And in between gigs, I would just direct short films, or I would shoot short films. And um, uh, at... And there was, you know, at one point it was like, you know, I just, I just want to shoot something. I had Drunk Town just finest in development and it was taking, you know, it was like in its like sixth year of just like rewriting. And I said, I just want to shoot something. I don't care. Um, I'm trying to get this film made and it's not getting made. I just want to shoot something. And so I was talking with a friend of mine. She said, well, stop complaining. Go just something. go shoot something. And so we talked for a little bit and we started talking about, you know, our, our childhoods. And um, I had this sort of affinity for Back to the Future 2. Well, well, of course. And, and we were talking about this idea. And this idea for the short film Hoverboard um, came out and essentially just got some friends together on a weekend. We shot it for two days. And it was just purely because, like, I just wanted to make something. Yeah. And, um, and that, that uh, short actually became a calling card that, um, for Deidre and Laney Robert Train. So I shot that in like 2011, mm-hmm. and we didn't shoot Deidre Lane until 2016. How do you find that short? Uh, so yeah, if you if you go on, it's on YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you do a YouTube search for hoverboard PBS, mm-hmm. um, it'll pop up. I mean, if you just do hoverboard, it'll probably show up too. So can you talk a little bit because you're talking about being a PA, and I know a lot of people listening are like trying to break into the business and and they get into the PA uh, aspect of things. But you got into camera and post. Mm-hmm. Explain how important that is being an independent filmmaker because I'm I've been in post for twenty odd years yeah. and I couldn't do what I do without that knowledge uh, without that experience same thing with my camera experience so can you explain how that impacted your yeah. filmmaking Yeah absolutely I mean it, you know having having a production background has been like, I mean it was so crucial for me to be able to direct my first feature right so um, I think being being a PA was. It, it was valuable because even though you may be on, a little bit on the periphery of a film set, mm-hmm. you're still learning something. You're in the right? orbit. Yeah, and so like I'm right. doing like Firewatch next to a generator for 12 hours, and I'm thinking like, what the, what the hell am so, I so doing? So explain to people what Firewatch so is. Fire, Firewatch is basically you're just standing guard. You know. So, so, the, the, so the generator, if it blows up, you'll get hit first, and then everybody can turn it up. Yeah, it out, yeah, basically. yeah. So it was like I think I think this this particular instance it was like shooting. Uh, I think it was a PA on a short film in New York, and uh-huh. it was a neighborhood that, that they didn't want anyone stealing the generator. Sure, that's so it. So I had to sit there, stand guard next to the generator for twelve hours. While it's like you know, like anyone who knows the Jennies on set, they're they're, they're not the quietest. Uh, oh my machines. god, yeah. And they um, smell wonderful. They do. The they, they do. smell yes. wonderful. Yeah, lovely yes. smell. <laughs> lovely of, uh, smell. <laughs> gasoline or diesel or whatever. Whatever. <laughs> so so um uh. So I think well, I didn't realize at the time, but I was learning something, right. you know. And so each sort of aspect that you work on, you're learning a little bit about the process. So when it came time, when I had the opportunity to direct my first feature, um, we didn't have a lot of money, and we had a very extremely short shoot, shoot schedule. It was a, a 15 day shoot um, for for this uh, for this feature that I had written. And what I found out during that process was, um, you know, everything moved so quickly. But I, I had a working knowledge of what I could or could not ask for, mm-hmm. you know. So like, like for example, they, you know, they would be like, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna shoot this scene out, and then we're going to um, this next one. We have to be at in forty five minutes, and so like I kind of doing like internal calculations. Okay, this how long does it take to break down the camera, get in the car, get it to the next place, mm-hmm. um, and so I could you know sort of like give my like production design. Okay, so I need you guys to have this set up by you know in approximately this time because we're gonna come in and we're gonna have to shoot, you know. And, um, and also, you know, in terms of editing as well, too, just knowing um, sort of like what... What you need. Yeah, what, what you need, what you don't need. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that being said, I still learned a hell of a lot. Of course. You know? yeah. and, but, and that was Drunk Town, right? That was Drunk Town, yes. When did Sundance come into the equation? So Sundance was uh, 2009. That was mm-hmm. the Native Lab. Mm-hmm. And then 2010 was the script of Drunk Town. Got it. 
And um, and so that's when we did 2010 did the Screeners Lab and Directors Lab with Drunk Town's Finest. Got it. And then 2013 is when we got the financing and shot the film, and then it premiered. In got it. 2014. During, and, and during all this time, what are you doing to like survive? <laughs> uh, yeah, just work again. Working production. You yeah, know, working production jobs. Yeah. What about Disney? Isn't were you Disney Fellowship or Disney Scholarship? What was yeah, that? Yeah, so that that was the internship uh, that I, I mentioned in Santa Fe. Mm-hmm. So it was a uh, ABC Disney did a summer summer program uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm-hmm. huh. and um, and that's where I met the person. It was uh, I mean it was a great program. Actually, I still keep in touch with probably like it's probably like a group of ten or fifteen of us. That still I mean, you couldn't have mapped this out if you I tried, mean, seriously, right? I mean, enough. you kind of just figured it out as you went along. Seems yeah, like. yeah, I very much made it up as I went along. And I think I think one thing that I've I I've sort of I had this sort of like really sort of interesting moment where so 2015 I, I participated in a program called the Fox uh, Global Directors Initiative. Yeah. 20 women women filmmakers um and during that point we everyone went around the table and they had to tell how they got to be in that room. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I think I've always sort of felt like an outsider to the film industry um, in terms of like, you know, okay, there is a path and people take that path. And um, I'm not taking that path, but I'm like in the woods trudging, trudging along trying to find my way, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, I think what I found out in this, so this is now 2015, and hearing all these women go around the table and tell their stories of how they got to be there, there's no one way, <laughs> you know? Everyone had like such different stories. Like people come from like a dancing background. People mm-hmm. come from like a, a writing background. People mm-hmm. come from you know some people come from families of filmmakers. Some people come from like uh, countries where there is no you know like countries where there's no film industry. And so I think that was a very valuable thing for me. You know, was realizing that there is no one way to become a filmmaker. And when I think it's it's I think a lot of as far as filmmakers are concerned. A lot of people think that that path that has been marketed so well, like you go to film school, you do this, you do that. Um, you learn a lot more going in the woods, in, in, on the side tracks. You'll survive out there much more than the guy who takes the pre, the, the guy or the girl that takes that pre-built path. And I think that's well, isn't it, isn't it well yes and no, but she sort of did. I mean, she did do film school, but the, 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 no, no, the, no, the, no, the thing about it is that that's not enough. Like people no, go school. to film school and yeah, they right. think. It's made, no, but it's not. In 1972, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you just went to film the, school the, then, yeah. Yeah, there's a huge, huge gap between film school and working in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I, not, not even work, making a living. <laughs> there's yes, work, because exactly, like, you can work, exactly. but then make a living, actually, is, yeah, is, a, whole, exactly. is a whole other story, <laughs> without question. Cool, you have any questions? No, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of just, just hearing the story. I mean, it's very inspiring. It's also sort of like, wow. No, it's, it's honestly, the, the story is, is so inspiring because the one thing I want, did want to say is that, and it's, it hopefully is an inspiration to anyone listening, is that you come from a, a place that you had no support as far as industry is concerned. No information, no knowledge, no anything. But you decided to start doing something. You started to go on that path, and it seems like the universe has helped you along the way because you just started that energy. You didn't well, wait well, for yes. someone to knock on the door for you. But I'm also wondering, I mean, I, the one, I do have the one question. I mean, this is the kind of story when I hear this one, I'm just like, what keeps you, like what, what drives you? I mean, what makes you do it? Because it, wasn't, it doesn't sound like it was very easy either. Uh, no, you know, no. You have a drive. There's no, there's no question <laughs> about that. There's a drive there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's definitely a drive there. Um, I, I mean, again, like I think, well, I, I just have two parts to that. I think one is that on really basic levels, like, I, I love making film, right? Um, and on a really basic level, it's like, I just, I, I had a story, I wanted to tell it. Mm-hmm. And the desire to tell that story outweighed the, um, you know, the rejections. You know, There's and, a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, forever, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, I think that's, that's one thing I had to learn was how to deal with rejection, because you get rejected way more than you get accepted. Oh. <laughs> I, I think I think when I was when I was doing actually doing production work and setting up my resume, yeah. like I got to this point where I was like, man, if I could get one callback out of twenty resume sendouts, that was like that's, that's I actually, was killing it. That, yeah, know? I was about yeah. to say that's really good. If yeah, you got yeah, that. I was like, I'm killing it. You know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you get those nineteen other. You know, like oh, unfortunately, you know, we're unfortunately we can't take you right now yeah. because of that. so. But I will. I do want to sort of like single out. You know, like the Sundance Labs, right? Because and specifically the the Sundance Native Lab, because 
So that was, I, I believe it was like 1985, and like that was founded by Robert Redford, you know, expressly for fostering Native American and indigenous uh, filmmaking talent. And so I, you know, for me, I, I'm sort of coming at this, like I want something to say and I don't know how to say it. And this program existed um, and, I, and I was fortunate enough to be selected for it and it gave me structure. You know, it gave me structure. It gave me a little bit of direction and a little bit of guidance where I was just sort of like, kind of like wandering through the woods and saying like, I just, I want to do something, but I don't know how to do it. You know, and so. Yeah, you are the embodiment of Sundance. But there is one thing that we almost forgot that this leads into, yeah. Standing Rock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, Standing Rock. Yeah. Yes, you are yeah. Standing Rock. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? <laughs> yeah, so I, um, uh, this past December, I was, um, I had the opportunity to go up to, uh, Standing Rock and shoot some footage for Vice uh, for their documentary Rise, which is actually showing here in uh, at the festival as well. Um, I think it's a fantastic. I, I shot I shot like this much footage for the thing, uh, so I had a chance to see it on Saturday night. I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing. But you were there. Yes. So, what's your experience of Standing yeah. Rock? So I would say, you know, it's it's. I think what's come out of it that's been positive is that Native Americans don't necessarily exist in popular culture or in, in mainstream American society. And what I, what I thought was so great about that was that Standing Rock and the protests, the No Dapple movement, um, elevated this issue and made it a, you know, part of the national sort of conversation. And it's very rare that happens for you know, the Native American community. Yeah. Um, international, a lot of interna yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yes, I, uh, internationally, yeah. it was it was an international event. Somehow, somehow, internationally, they embrace Native Americans more than Did we Americans. Yeah, that's, that's Americans. That, that is true. Which, yeah, that yes, is true. Yeah, I think with, with Drunk Town, it, it was interesting. Like, I found you know an audience, an audience, you know, specifically like in Europe, mm -hmm. very interested in that. But I guess to get back to Sandy Rock, it was, I, I think for me, it was it was hard to watch stuff, you know, from a distance and see like, you know explicit and blatant, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, an unnecessary use of force against unarmed and unarmed sort of population who were peacefully protesting. Um, and I think the, the day we actually got there was the day that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, denied and uh, they had an easement denial mm -hmm. for the, um, uh, for the um, uh, Dakota Access Pipeline to continue moving forward. And that was a, at the time it was, it felt like a victory you know, because it was like, wow, like, look at what this can, you know, this was a nonviolent, peaceful protest. And it... it on one side, it was nonviolent. <laughs> yes, 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 sorry. Yes, on, 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 um, on, the na on the Native side. And it actually made a difference, you know? And, I mean, for me, that was, that was amazing. Because usually, like, Natives get fucked, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yes, they do. Uh, yeah. The Americans get fucked, and in oh, so, I, sorry, I don't know. If I it's okay. It's fine. Okay. We, 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 we curse. Okay. We curse yeah. all the fucking. Although we have okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So 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 you know we're making you look bad, but yeah. no, no, it's no, hard no, to no, make no, you look no. bad actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're the riffraff. So thank you for coming down. Yeah. And, and, and so and so I you know like I felt like I I wanted to do something yeah. and. Um, I had this opportunity to go and shoot footage. At the time, I didn't know it was for Vice. I didn't know it was for Rise. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to go out there and like try to do something. And you know, if I could see these people on this other side and look them face to face, you know, and then I wanted to be able to look these people in the eye and ask them like, "Why are you guys doing this?" Um, and uh, it, it was, I think, it was a really amazing experience for me because I got to see natives from. You know, Native American and indigenous people from not only from the U.S. or Canada, but from all over the world, you know, coming together in this like huge um, Osheti Sakawin camp, mm -hmm. and uh, and everyone is there with one sole purpose, you know, save the water. You and know? it was it was the first time that all the tribes got together, right? In in, in American history, right? If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I am not a historian, but it was I would say is one of the one of if not the largest sort of gathering of. All of Americans, yeah. At one time. Yeah. I can't even remember the last time there was a protest of that size. 
other than a few days ago. That um, <laughs> the women's other than the women's march. Other than the women's Which march. It would have been better had it not right. been, you know, yeah. so cold out in most Yeah, of the, exactly. The, the, the but no, but like something like, you know, like I remember Sel- I mean, obviously Martin Luther King and Selma and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it's one it's like but, that. Yeah, but like a political, you know, it's ha- a full on movement. It's a full on movement. I hadn't seen anything like Although that. Although what's interesting the 60s. about it is we don't have one person yet that embodies it like like Martin Luther King. Not yet, I mean, yeah. There yeah. isn't the person Yeah, that, there was no one standout at Standing Rock. There was there? Was, was there a leader? There it, isn't yet. Yeah, there, there, there there's are, a handful. Yeah, there's a handful. There's yes. a handful of people, but there wasn't like the Martha. Martin but maybe Luther that's King a good thing too. But I don't that's know. That's true. Yeah, that because might. it's a movement as opposed to a person. I don't know. It's right. interesting. Yeah. But that's very interesting. So let me ask you one last uh, question. What advice would you give a filmmaker just starting out, where you were in that parking lot <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all those years ago? I, I think I think that the most important lesson I've I've been able to take away is just. <clears throat> Learn, learn to accept rejection okay. and learn, but not only that, learn to, learn to see rejection as an opportunity to make your story better. You know, uh, if it gets rejected, um, maybe, you know, to be perfectly honest, maybe it wasn't good enough, you know, but take that and try to use that to say, what can I make, what can I do to make this project better? Or what can I do to make this story better? Um, I think that to me was one of the, biggest learning experiences I had to go through because it's it's tough it's tough it's tough to get rejected oh god <laughs> yeah in a, in a creative environment as well I mean it's tough to get rejected in general but yes. like when it's your creative baby or something like that it's really 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 tough exactly yeah uh, and one last question I always ask all my uh, my guests um yeah. one of your favorite movies of all time oh man <laughs> Um, Not Back to the Future too. Back to the Future too. It's, <laughs> it's up there. We, we could do a whole interview on the Back. It's to so future. funny that I'm she like likes s- Back to the Future too, because I'm I'm obviously Back to the Future one, and then Back to the Future three, no. and two is like well, uh, two in a lot of ways. All right, we'll, we'll geek out for a second. <laughs> uh, two in a lot of ways. A lot of people just call it the connective tissue between yeah three because so three it's is funny awesome that you like that. One. And I actually really enjoyed two. Looking back at it, when I first saw, it, I mean, one is you know one. Yeah, yeah. But two now go, now that we're past 2015. It's so awesome to watch what they thought, and oh, so many wow. things they got right. Yeah, it yeah. was kind of like that's. Uh, I have to watch it again. Yeah, it's so crazy. Like you know, they had Google glasses like uh, back then. Oh, they did. They did. They yeah, had Google glasses. They had the the, the um, uh, FaceTime, you know, going yeah. on. They had a, they got a lot of stuff, are you know, incredibly right. And you know, there there is a hoverboard now. Yeah, yeah, they do yeah, have the the, the, the well, Lex one. Yeah, right? not like yeah, just not like the one he did, but yeah. it's pretty cool. All right, so your favorite, your favorite movie? Yeah. Uh, favorite movie? I, I don't know. I, I, if what's coming to mind is more like movies that I watch over and over again. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I think for me, just off the top of my head, um, I would say Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Oh, um, that's a yeah, movie. yeah, right. That's, a, that's, yeah. A, that's, that's Adam Bowman's favorite, yeah. one of his um, favorite movies. That's, that's Deacons who shot that, right? Roger Deacons. Shh, um, so beautiful that movie. Who also did uh, Back to the Future? Deacons? De- did he? Didn't write no, Deacons? No, Deacons didn't do Back to the Future. Dean. Oh, that's Dean. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was okay. Dean Cundy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't Deacons. I'm uh, sorry. We're so film geeking out right now. Sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, I'd say Shaun of the Dead is another one. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. I, Edgar, I'm a huge Edgar Wright fan. Oh, he's so amazing, um, isn't he? Yeah, I wish he would hurry up and make another movie. I know. Like, um, His Ant Man would have been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> His Ant Man right? would have been so. I, I, you could see, you could, you could see smell him in it. Yeah. the Edgar Wright stank. Yeah. On yeah. a lot of that <laughs> of that movie, you could like, oh, that, oh, that's what the, uh, they got. That got in. Exactly, that got in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, like, what else? Like the, I don't know. For some reason, like the. These like when I was doing Drunk Town, right? Because Drunk Town like mm-hmm. seven years, and these are like the films I would watch over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like the David Fincher Zodiac film, mm-hmm. which is, which is yeah. one of all right, cool. Yeah, is, that's, that's my guy. Yes, it's honestly I'm a huge Fincher fan. I've been right. studying him since the commercial days. Yeah, like I was, I had, I had a connection to propaganda, and they would send me his commercials, uh, and like wow. his his short films and stuff on VHS. So uh, wow. he like do these compilations of his demo reels, like stuff that no, no one I've ever seen. Yeah, and I just sit there and watch and study all that. And I'm a huge Fincher fan. So Zodiac's one of those underrated, because it's now yeah. starting to come back up as a masterpiece. It's like one of those, wow. you know, like when Kubrick makes one of his movies and he's like, oh, like 10 years yeah. later, like, oh my God. Yeah, so yeah. Zodiac's one of those. Yeah. And I think, I think the thing that I find interesting, like those are all like on paper, those are films that I don't think I would like. Mm-hmm. And yet like I'm like, Completely fascinated he's, by all of them. And he's in. He's just you know Fincher's. Yeah. Fincher's our current day Kubrick, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 So, well, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, you for was, having it me. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Yeah.
Thanks for watching. I am guys. inspired. I think I think it's really a great story. Go make your movie. Yeah, Keep guys. going. Yeah, thanks.